Okay. I chose an anchor because of Hebrews chapter 6. A couple of weeks ago, we closed one of the services out with Hebrews chapter 6 that we have a more and sure anchor for our souls. And of course, that's the living word, Jesus Christ, and the written word that he has preserved for us through all of these centuries. And so the anchor is a symbol of this uh, new Bible study here. Now, let's pause here for a few minutes and think about some questions I want to ask you. First of all, how would you define the word hope? How would you define the word hope? I think most people use certain words and they have some type of a ethereal concept about it, kind of a lofty concept that you can't really put your hands on. You can't wrap your head around it, kind of fluff. How would you explain hope to another person? If someone came and shared a situation and you saw from their body language and from their words that they were very discouraged. How would you explain the concept of hope to someone else? You see, beloved, if you cannot define hope, you won't be able to explain it to other people. Now, here's a question for you. Which of the following statements would define most people's understanding of hope. I'm going to give you two statements. Which one do you think the average person uses to define hope? I hope that our careful planning will result in completing this task. I know Aunt Sally will appreciate the gift we got her. Now, which one do you think might best represent the common person's definition of hope? The first one or the second one? I suggest to you that the first one is wishful thinking. And hope is not wishful thinking. Let me back up. I hope that our careful planning will result in accomplishing the task. That's wishful thinking. However, hope is a confident belief. And that is, I know that Aunt Sally will appreciate the gift we got her. Do you see the difference between the two? I sure hope we have a good time. I sure hope the lines won't be long at Disney World. I sure hope that the sale is still going on at Walmart. I sure hope the car will start under six feet of snow. I sure hope, I sure hope, I sure hope. That's wishful thinking. There's no confidence behind that. But biblical hope, beloved, is a confident belief. It is a confident assertion. And the reason hope is a confident assertion is because you are speaking biblical truth. You are speaking biblical truth. And this is important as we develop this word. And what we're going to be doing is a theosity, T-H-E-O-C-I-T-Y, theosity, which simply means a developing a theology around a certain word or a concept. And that's what we're going to try to do here with the concept of hope. Now. Every, everyone God brings across your path needs hope. Let me just stop and pause there for a moment. 
Everyone that God brings across your path needs hope. For example, on Sunday when we gather together, Lord willing, and the crick don't rise, whoever you greet on Sunday, you must realize that they need hope. They need a confident assertion about the will of God. Now, in order to give hope, you need to follow some communication lessons that we talked about, right? You need to listen. You need to inquire how they are doing, what is going on in their life. And you should also be, <clears throat> excuse me, very skeptical when you ask them, hey, how you doing? And you can look at them and know that when they tell you everything's fine, that it's not fine. Remember body language. Everybody needs hope. I don't think there's a person on planet Earth right now that doesn't need some level of hope. Now, with that, let me explain the rest of this premise here. The extent of hope is directly proportionate to the gravity of sin. An example, the sin the person is involved with. That's the gravity of the sin, the sin that the person is involved with. And the extent of hope is uh, directly proportioned to the gravity of sin and the degree of consequences. In other words, the duration the person has lived with the effects of sin. Now, I'm going to leave that up there for a minute. However, I did include it in your notes that you have there. And I'm going to show you a diagram here. I couldn't, I couldn't cut and paste it into your notes. This is an important premise about giving hope to a discouraged person. What's the example of sin? Or what is their situation? What's the example of the situation? And how long have they been involved in that situation? Here's the diagram. The gravity of sin or the example, and then the degree or the duration living in sin. Let me see if I can give you an illustration here. Uh, Mary comes to you and she shares with you that in the last one or two weeks, her husband has just not been himself. He has been irritable. He has been nitpicking. She feels like she can't do anything right. And she feels like she has some type of deficiency in her life. She's doing something wrong, but she can't quite put her finger on it. Now, I've already told you the gravity of the sin, and I already told you the degree or the duration of the sin the last couple of weeks. Now, do you think that's going to require months and months and months of counseling to give hope? No, it should not, because the gravity of sin is not that serious. Now, don't misunderstand me. Sin is serious, but the gravity of the sin falling short Failing to meet an expectation is not as grave as the wife committing adultery. So another example, John comes in for counseling. And after you've done your data gathering, you begin to realize, and he, he, he uh, states it clearly, uh, I just can't get this monkey off my back. I'm addicted to cocaine. And you do your gathering of data and information. And as you're talking with him, he tells you uh, that this, this started when he was 20 years old in college and he is now 37 years old. You see the difference between him and Mary? He's going to need a lot of hope because 
of the seriousness of the sin, and again, don't misunderstand me when I say the seriousness of sin. All sin is serious, but you, I hope you understand what I'm saying. And then the duration. 17 years he has been struggling with this monkey on his back. So it's going to require a lot of indoctrination of biblical teaching about hope, how to change the thinking, different things like that. Notice the point of where the sin is at, the star there, and notice how it fans out into a sideways triangle. That's to give a visualization. The closer the lines are towards the star, the sin and the invent, the less hope that has to be given. But the further you get away because of primarily time, it's going to require uh, intense uh, mentoring, discipleship, biblical instruction. We sometimes error when we lead someone to the Lord and they reveal a life of perpetual sin. life of perpetual sin and they're involved with a discipleship ministry you're discipling them they're attending church they're involved with service uh, the accountability of them reading their bible and spiritual disciplines and so forth and so on uh, is there and so after a couple of weeks we think wow we're on top of this and we need to be reminded that the good seed fell in the soil and it sprung up quickly. But then the heat of the day came in and withered it. By way of example, there is going to be great excitement, the thrill of change, seeing change lasting week after week but you know what if you and i have not identified what prompts john to go ahead and get back involved with cocaine is he running away from a problem what what's going on what's the cause all we're dealing with is the behavior and don't be surprised if it happens again all of us need hope throughout our entire lifetime, beloved. I don't care how old you are. We need hope. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to have somebody, you know, at my side or riding my back, speaking words of hope into my ear. We need the word of God and to understand how to draw the strength of hope from the word of God. That is maturity on our part to do that. But until we can help someone reach that point of maturity where they can, like King David did when he was a refugee from Saul, comforted himself in the Lord. That's a sign of great maturity in a person's life. So this is a visual of that premise that we talked about a few minutes ago. Now, let me pause here. Does anybody have any questions about that visual or what I'm saying up to this particular point? Okay. Now, how would you provide hope? I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios here. And it's just a scenario it's not taken from any of my experience in counseling, but it's it's designed to kind of prick your conscience about, well, how would I provide hope? Newlyweds, they're in the late 20s. They have lived together now, uh, lived together, and they know each other for four months. What kind of hope do you think that they need? Many times, hope is related 
to dealing with the consequences of sin. Hope certainly is related to the circumstances of life, but many times it's related to the consequences of sin. So how would you help this newlywed? How would you provide hope to them? Now, the basis of all these little scenarios, obviously, is the starting point of salvation. That is to be assumed. A marriage that is based on fornication resulting in a child. They're married, but prior to getting married, they fornicated, and as a result, there was a child. They have a child now in this relationship. How would you provide hope? What might you say to provide encouragement and direction? Biblical hope provides direction. Biblical hope provides direction. And then a wife raised in a Christian home, this might sound kind of silly, and admits to racing through stop signs. <laughs> so if you were to put that on that little diagram that I gave you, she'd probably be really close down to that little star, right? Unless she's a 67-year-old and she's done this for 50 years. Uh, how would you give hope? And then a husband, two previous relationships with two other children, paying child support on one. How would you give hope? What would you say? Where would you help them with? And then a stillborn nine-month daughter. How would you give hope? How would you provide that? Now, I kind of tricked you here a little bit because the two questions that should be answered or asked is what are the real issues and how would you specifically buy, provide hope? And I mentioned it in a different form a, a few minutes ago. What is the core issue? In biblical counseling terms, it's called the idol of the heart. So what is the idol of the heart? What are the real issues? Here, Because, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if we don't identify the idol, if you don't get to the real issues, all you're going to be doing is putting a large Band-Aid on an open wound that will continue to fester and rot the limb off. What are the real issues? And how would you specifically provide hope once you identify the real issues? That's very, very important. These two questions are extremely important. All right, here's what we're going to study over the next couple of weeks that we are together. Who needs hope? Well, Rick, you already told us everybody needs hope. Well, I want you to be a little bit more specific, a little bit more specific, and you'll have a homework assignment here in a few minutes. And then... We want to take a look at the Bible's emphasis on hope. The Bible has a lot to say about the concept of hope, the reality of hope. And that encourages us and gives us confidence that we can share the reality of hope with somebody else. And then we want to take a look at the false objects of hope. A lot of people put their hope in things that are shifting sand. The story that Jesus told of the two people who build houses, one on a rock, the other one on the sand, and the storms came. The house on the rock stood, the house on the sand washed away. A lot of people place their hope in objects that are are false, and the Bible will give us at least 10 or 11 specific false objects that we are not to put our hope in. We are not to put our hope in. In fact, I mentioned all of these in the message prior to the end of the year. And then, why can I be confident to provide hope? 
in and of, in and of myself, I, I don't know whether I could help any of those scenarios. But I can gain confidence to provide hope. The Bible will educate me. The Bible will encourage me, will strengthen me. And then what are the principles underlying steadfast hope? What are the principles underlying steadfast hope? Again, hope is not a hope so. Hope is a confident assertion. And that confident assertion rests upon some underlying principles. And we need to know what those are. And then as we wrap this up in the weeks ahead, we're going to talk about practical, measurable ways to provide hope. And when we get into this, you're going to just say, boy, this is so simple, I should have realized it. Yeah, probably. And when I first discovered these things, I kind of hit myself upside the head. And yeah, I should have recognized this. But we, we seem to grasp at the clouds in the sky when we try to give hope to somebody, as opposed to um, the concrete stuff, the, uh, the dirt in the ground, if you please. There are very practical, measurable ways to provide hope. Let me give you one example so you don't, we don't end this broadcast frustrated. One of the practical ways to give hope is the names of God. The names of God. Here we have a middle-aged man, and he is with a major company international company, and they are downsizing. COVID has hit them extremely hard. Now, they have offered this man to relocate him, but he would be responsible for finding another place to live, etc. He has two children in college, and he's taken a second mortgage out on the house to help pay for their tuition. So he really can't relocate. His wife's parents are in the same community and they are aging. And so there's a responsibility there. What should he do? How would you provide hope? What name of God? What name of God would you use and explain to this man to give him hope? in the decision that he might need to make. That's one practical way to do that. And keep in mind, there are many, many different names for God in the Bible. So here's a little diagram I put together today. I was thinking about hope and what does it affect? What can it influence? What can it deal with? Well, if you go around the circle, it certainly can deal with doubt, can it? It can deal with fear. It can help me control my emotions. It can give me confidence about the future. It can help me address fear and worry and anxiety. Hope is essential. It is critical to the Christian's walk and life in this godless, hopeless world that we live in. Not much hope in 2020, was there? A lot of mixed reports, a lot of different perspectives that caused confusion and chaos. And 2021 might not be any better, but is our confidence in situations, in governments, and people, in, in Wall Street, in medical, our hope has got to be in God and the word of God that he's given to us. I can handle the present if I have hope. I can deal with the future, even though I don't know what it is, but my hope and my confidence is that God is in control of my future. 
He has already inscribed me on the palms of his hands. He has plans for me, not of adversity, but of prosperity. See, that's hope. That's hope. When we left the ministry in Colorado, I was not a happy camper. Very, very discouraged and angry with God's people and the churches that I served in. I took a job at Moody Bible Institute at a 50% reduction of what I was making in the ministry. I lived about an hour and 15 minutes away from downtown Chicago and had to travel the Metra train. And as I struggled with my own anger and discouragement, got all this stinking education, and I was flashing my spiritual resume, and that didn't encourage me whatsoever. As I sat on that train, and as I began to read and meditate and think and pray, God began to build hope in me for the future. When I went to Moody, I worked in the Mail Center, which was a outsourcing arm of the Institute. We processed 1.3 pieces, 1.3, huh, 1.3 million pieces of mail by hand. It was all hand insertion work. And there was a whole whopping crew of four of us that did this. Uh, and so I worked a machine. I think I found at one time D.L. Moody's initial inscribed on the machine. It worked as well as D.L. Moody did back then, probably. It was a notoriously difficult machine. It was supposed to grab the inserts, put them in an envelope, and close the lid. And I challenged uh, one operator. I said, I'll bet you I can stuff more by hand than that machine can. Well, the machine proved me to be a liar. But it was just really, really frustrating. Uh, Dwayne Koenig was the supervisor at that time, and he was being transferred over to Moody Press which was like about a four-time gazillion larger outfit that he had ever supervised. And so a young man by the name of Dan was next in line to be the supervisor of the mail center. Well, Dan was a blonde-headed, little skinny upstart of a kid. And he strutted his stuff. Uh... He didn't last very long, and I was not looking to move into that position, but every time I went down on that train, and I was reading Daniel and other Bible characters, I simply asked the Lord if he would please promote me to a position in the institute that he was preparing for me. Well, lo and behold, I became the supervisor of the mail center. And then from there, I wound up over in academic records, a part of the educational branch, registering all three divisions of the Institute's educational program, uh, the seminary and the college and the evening school. And then while I was doing that, I was privileged to go ahead and teach one course in evening school. And from there, it took on a life of its own where I was teaching five or six classes a week, not counting Saturdays. God gave me hope that we wouldn't always be stuck in this inner city, three-bedroom garden apartment surrounded as a minority and the cultural differences, he gave me hope. 
That's how important hope is in our life. Without it, you're going you're gonna to struggle with doubt and worry and fear and anxiety in your thought life and your emotions. You, we're just going to struggle. And that's not a part of the abundant life that Jesus has given to us. So I hope that, uh, hope, I am confident that <laughs> we are going to be able to learn together. Now, here's your assignment for next week. I want you to make a specific list of people you know who need hope. And then just one sentence, why? Now, you're not going to share this on the broadcast, but this is a good exercise to quicken your mind to listen and to see how desperate people are clutching to anything that propagates. If you do this, everything will be okay. All right. Thoughts from anybody at this particular point? I have one. Yes, Miss Sue. Um, one day I was talking about hope to someone and they said, oh, you and your hope, always talking about hope. And I said to them, I said, if you don't have hope, what do you have? What reason is there to live? And um, it's true, and I think that's why the young people and there's so many suicides, they have no hope. You know, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I saw a report just before the broadcast here tonight of a high percentage of suicides of the age bracket 18 to, to 25 because of the lockdown and the pandemic and different things like that. Yeah, what do we have to look forward to? What? What? And I don't think we give the kids a chance, or we give them any hope either. You know, that's a very good observation, Sue. And my my mind would raise this question, and it's it's networking with a red flag. I haven't used that phrase in a long time, uh, or the red thread the red thread. And the red thread that I'm thinking about right now is that when Joshua and the elders died, the next generation did not know of the mighty works of God. And we are beyond that now. We're down to the third and fourth generation because yeah. each adult generation is not communicating the great works of God that God has done in our lives. And I don't know why we have such a locked jaw. Are we afraid of what people will think of us? Are we afraid that they might ask a question we can't answer? Are we afraid to be embarrassed? Look, if people ridicule us, if they mock us, in reality, beloved, don't leave your house without your rhinoceros skin. OK, <laughs> they're not they're not ridiculing you. They're not ridiculing the messenger. They're ridiculing the message. And the message is always true. That's our hope in any situation. The message is true. How do you think some of these World War Two and Holocaust survivors made it through? Corey Tinboom and others like that. How did they make it through? Because they had the hope of their relationship with Christ and the confidence, even though they couldn't explain it, they couldn't understand it, and they were mocked by the Jew, uh, the, uh, the Germans, they knew God was still in control. You're right, Sue, you're right. But I think a lot of the blame comes back on us for the discouragement of the children. We have not modeled before them hope we have we have shown how we have pursued cisterns, as Isaiah talks about, that are filled with dirty water, crumbs on the ground. 
That's a good observation. Yep. Excellent, Sue. I'm proud of you. Thank you. You can go to the head of the class. I'm proud of myself, too. Uh -oh. Watch it. Watch it now. <laughs> watch it. <laughs> Next session will be on pride. <laughs> Oh, no, that's a great observation, though, Sue. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. All right. Anybody else? Any other thoughts, questions? All right. Thursday, Scientology Part 2. Um, Sunday, um, especially, not especially, I'm always excited about getting up to preach, but as we continue this series in heaven, we're going to talk about how many heavens are there? And what makes it so important for the Christian to know which heaven God lives in? Why is that so important? And we're going to have some great music. I hope none of you will necessarily be offended by it. It will not be your traditional hymnal music. Because if you take a look at the hymnal in our church, you can't find a song about heaven. <laughs> it's just not there. So uh, I hope you'll listen more to the words and close your eyes and not be so objectionable that it might be a different artist who might be singing. All right, you guys know that you're loved and you're prayed for and you're cared for. Uh, if you need anything, uh, give Larry a call. He'll be glad to help you out. <laughs> no, give me a call. Don't call Larry. <laughs> all right, my friends. You're friend. here. You're here if you need us, by all means. I know you are. I know you are. All right, my friends. Have a good night. God bless. No.